Good evening. Welcome to our evening service, midweek evening service. Would you open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 34? We are in Exodus 34 today. We're starting uh, this chapter. We'll be covering the first uh, 10 verses. Next Sunday, we should have our um, Easter uh, flyers, our Easter invitations. Uh, check out the foyer if you uh, have someone in mind that you want to invite to come to Easter service. Uh, please take uh, as many as you need. Exodus 34, verses 1 to 10. And the message I titled, Let's Try This Again. Let's Try This Again. We're looking at, if you've been with us, you know what you... You probably know what I'm talking about, the, the Ten Commandments, right? The first set of Ten Commandments uh, were broken by Moses. When he got to the foot of the mountain, the people themselves were breaking the, the Ten Commandments, and he broke them in, in a display of anger. Uh, I would say righteous anger. He was angry at the, what the people were doing. They were committing idolatry, worshiping the golden calf and whatnot, and everything else that came with that. So... The covenant needs to be renewed. The commandments need to be on display. So Moses is uh, doing the work of mediator here, doing the work of the, the man in the middle, if you will. And he's coming back to, to the top of the mountain to plead with God. Two weeks ago, I wasn't here last week. I was sick. But uh, two weeks ago when we covered chapter 33 we, uh, in a message I titled uh, Presence, looking at the presence of God, we saw that now Moses was meeting with God at a, at a tent, a tent below the mountain. It was away from the people, and people could go, you know, close to the tent and worship God, but that's where Moses was meeting God temporarily. And now God is giving him instructions to sort of come back up the mountain. And one of the things that we covered in chapter 33 was that God initially told Moses, okay, I'm going to, you know, get you, I'm going to keep my promises to you guys, the Israelites. You're going to get into the promised land. You're going to get the blessings that, you know, I gave Abraham and so on. But there was one, uh, one thing that they weren't going to get anymore. At least initially, that's what it seemed. God said, I'm going to send an angel. He's going to go before you guys. But I'm not going to, I, I personally am not, I'm not going to go with you guys. And um, that was a problem for Moses. Because Moses refused to go any further in the right direction if God was not going to be uh, there. So we see this back and forth between him and God where he's sort of pleading with God. At the same time, he's also asking God to, uh, for more of his glory. Moses always wanted to see more of God in his life. And God said, okay, this is what we're going to do. I want you to stand over here on this rock. I'm going to sort of cover, uh, I'm going to cover you with my hand so you don't see my, uh, my full glory. Because seeing God's full glory would you know, end up killing a, a man. Uh, but the Bible says that he saw, Moses saw the backside of God. It, it would seem that he saw an afterglow of, of the Lord. And the Bible does tell, tell us elsewhere that uh, uh, when he came down with the second, second set of commandments, he did have a, a radiance to him, a sort of glory, uh, a, a physical, literal radiance that came. And I believe that's because he was in the presence uh, of God. So that was kind of interesting and so on. Here are some points just to refresh your memory from the last two, uh, two weeks ago. It's, about, it's not about his presence, but his presence, right? It's not about what God gives us per se, but about God himself being in our lives. Uh, number two, we cannot be God's active people without God's active presence. Number three, God's glory will, will either pass by us or passes by. His glory will either pass by us, that's a good thing, or passes by, which is not, not a good thing, right? We want to take advantage of um, as much of God as we can get in our life, as much of God as we can experience uh, um, in our life. So this message is really, these 10 verses at least, are really about a fresh start, about a God of second chances, where God now is going to, you know, uh, do a new work in the life of, uh, of the Israelites. He's going to renew the covenant. So let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer and, uh, and see what, uh, what the Lord has for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here this evening. And I ask, Lord, that you would uh, uh, minister to us, to our hearts, as you always do faithfully, Lord, individually through your word. We know your word is, uh, your word is uh, living, it's active, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates our hearts, Lord. That's our prayer this uh, evening, that you would, uh, uh, Lord, do what you need to do in our hearts. Convict us, challenge us, encourage us, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So let's go ahead and break the text down here. Let's just go verse by verse, starting in uh, verse 1. Again, we're in chapter 34 of Exodus. And it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Remember, they're at the bottom still. He's, they're, not, they're not conversating at the top. He says, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. So be ready in the morning, he says. Be ready in the morning. So, so Moses doesn't forget. God reminds him, you broke the tablets. And I want you to get two new tablets. And I want you to be ready in the morning. I was studying this word uh, ready. And, and again, it's in the Old Testament. It's in, it's in uh, Hebrew. And it means to be prepared. It means to be established. And when I was, you know, was checking out the verses where this word is used again, it's used, uh, you know, the, if you know the story of, um, of Samson, after he sins, after his eyes are gouged out, when he gets a second chance, um, and he asks the, this young lad who, you know, um, was holding him, when he, he asked him to put him next to these pillars, right? And he holds on to these pillars. And Well, that same word, is, is uh, this word ready is the same Hebrew word that is used for the, the firmness of the pillars. And what God is trying, what I'm trying to say here is that God is telling Moses in, in verse 2 here, when he says be ready, he says be firm. Be firm, be established like a pillar. And he tells them the time, right? He tells them this was to be in the morning. And he says, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. And present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. That word present just means to stand, stand before. I want you to stand before me again at the top of the mountain. Verse 3 says, And no man shall come up with you, and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before the mountain. And this is not different. This is always the, the rule. They, no one was supposed to go up there uh, with Moses. We do read about Joshua going up there uh, the first time who would eventually, uh, you know, take over, um, you know, Israel, and he, he would cross the Israelites into, uh, into Israel, into the promised land. <clears throat> Verse 4 says, So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Notice that he's cutting two tablets of stones like the first ones before he, um, he climbs up there with them. I hope they're, uh, you know, thin, thin tablets, because if they're pretty heavy, then, you know, it's going to be a tough trip up there. It says that Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. So you can imagine he's got two tablets, but they're, you know, they're clean. It's like a clean slate that he's carrying up there. It says in verse 5, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Moses is not the one proclaiming the name of the Lord. It's, it's the Lord himself who's proclaiming uh, his name. But I want you to notice that it wasn't until Moses arrived at the top of the mountain that God then descended in a cloud. In verse 6, it says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So what is God doing here? Why, why is God, obviously God is not boasting about himself when he's doing this. And, and this was uh, typical or general of, of God doing a new work in somebody's life. He is uh, uh, renewing the covenant. This is like a, a vocal, verbal agreement here, and he's renewing the covenant, and, and part of that renewal is to vocalize, communicate the, the truths about the person of God. Who is God? And here we, see, we look at the heart of God. We see that the God of the Old Testament is, is long-suffering, right? He is forgiving. He is kind. But he's also a judge, right? The Bible says that God is love, but the Bible also says that God is a consuming fire. So God is a just, but he's a just judge, and he is going to judge the sins of those that refuse to repent. The wicked that refuse to, uh, you know, uh, to ex if we're talking about now, those that refuse to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, those that continue to, uh, to deny him, there will be judgment eventually if they die in that state. 
But here we see that the, that the, the character of the over-encompassing character of God is love, right? It's mercy for thousands, it says, and forgiveness and so on. And that's good news because Moses uh, wants to tap into God's grace because they had just sinned and a lot of people had died as well. Let's continue here in verse uh, 8. It says, So Moses made haste, or in other words, in a hurry. It says, In a hurry he bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And I think, you know, this is good, a good tip from Moses. We can learn something from Moses here, from his behavior. Uh, here, God has revealed himself in a, in a powerful way, and now he, well, the first thing he does is, is get on his knees and he worships him, right? That, that should be our first response as well when we encounter the presence of God, just worshiping him. Before he says anything, he just bows down first, and he worships the Lord. Verse 9 says, Then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord... Let my Lord, I pray, go among us. Remember that? He refuses to go forward in the right direction without God. I believe Moses is trying to secure the moment here. Because in the past, when God says, okay, I'm going to start fresh with you, we're just going to annihilate all the Israelites, and we're just going to start over with you, Moses. And, and Moses prays to God, and he's like, Lord, no, Lord, don't do that. And he prays God's word back to him. He tells him, look, what about the promises you gave the Israelites and so on? Are you going to go back in your promises? And, and, and it's not that he changed God's mind. From our view, it might seem that way, but, you know, God is constant, and, and God was pushing Moses to, to pray. And here Moses, again, he sees that his prayers do have an effect. His prayers can move um, you know, seem to make things happen. So he's praying. That's what we should do as well. We shouldn't overthink it. Well, you know, God knows what I need. Should I pray? Should I not pray? Yeah, you should pray. The Bible says to pray. And the Bible also says that God is omniscient. He knows all things. But just pray and trust God. So it says here, uh, even though we are a stiff-necked people, I want you to notice how Moses here, even though he's not the one that was stubborn, he, he uh, includes himself here. He says, we are a stiff-necked people. In other words, stubborn people. And he says, pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. So he includes himself here. And isn't that a contrast be from him and his brother? I remember Aaron? Aaron, who, who refused to take responsibility, who basically tried to blame everybody else. Well, you left, you know, and, you know, well, I threw the, the calf, the, you know, we threw the gold in the, in the fire and all that, and, and that's how he came out, a golden calf. And he refused to take responsibility for, for his actions, but not Moses. Moses here, seemingly innocent, was including himself, and that's something we can learn from as well. Last verse we're reading here in verse 10, it says, and he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvelous marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among whom you are, you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. I bet you Moses didn't regret waking up early that day and climbing. You know, even if it was a tough climb, having to carry two tablets, however heavy they were, um, here we see that he has God's favor. He has God's favor. Something new is happening, right? He's going to come back down from the mountain. I, and obviously, not this time. He's not going to break the, the tablets this time. Um, but, but that's what's happening, right? And there are some repetitive things here, especially in chapters 35 to 40. We might summarize a lot of that that we've already covered already in the previous months. But... Um, but the reality is this. Moses is a man that obeys the Lord. Moses is a man that is responsible for the people that he has been uh, uh, placed over. And we can learn a few things from, uh, uh, from Moses. God was, God was going to renew the covenant here, right? Because it had been broken. But first, Moses needed to do something. What was that? Moses needed to obey the Lord. And what I want to tell you today is that, you know, the God that we serve is the same God as we read about here. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. He is a God of second chances. Not just second, but third, fourth, and fifth chances. Paul tells us in Romans where, where, grace, uh, where sin abounds, grace superabounds. Where there is sin, there, there, there is even more grace. Not as an excuse to sin, but as, as a reality, as a fact for the believer. So what I'm saying here, and I want to speak to those of you that, you know, because I, I mean, I, I can be in that place as well, you know, because I, I messed up too. I sin as well, and I can feel um, guilty, and I can feel um, often our sin can cause us to feel overburdened and so on, and like, well, I messed up just one too many times. 
I said, well, I wasn't going to do this anymore. I was going to start the new year 2018 fresh. And, and, and here I just blew it again, right? I just, you know, God's not going to use me anymore. And those are, you know, maybe you've said things like that or, or, or similar things like that. But the reality is that we do have a God of second chances. And that's what's happening here, really. In a nutshell, God is giving them a second chance. So the question for us shouldn't be, you know, uh, can I have a second chance? But can I take a second chance? That's our first point. The question is not, can I get a second chance, but will I take the second chance that's there? And God gives us the opportunity to go up to him and, and ask and, and seek for the, the grace that, that, that comes after the initial grace. See, we need grace upon grace. I believe that, <clears throat> that God's initial, uh, what God wants to do in our life is, is, is bless us. He doesn't want to curse us. He does, he does, you know, discipline us as his children, but... but as a father, I can tell you, having four kids, uh, my first choice is not to discipline. I mean, I, I prefer to bless my kids, right? Obviously, I don't bless misbehavior, but, but our first choice is to bless our kids, those we love, not to discipline them and, and so on, though sometimes that has to happen. And I think it's the same with God, our loving uh, Father, who offers mercy and grace where, where it's needed, so question here is, are we like Moses, willing and able to do what is required of us to get more grace? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you can earn grace. No, I don't think you can earn grace. Grace, by definition, it's something unmerited. You can't, you, you can't work for it, right? You read Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We're saved by grace through faith, not by works, so nobody can boast. Not of yourself, not of works. It's from the Lord. So this is what I see here. I think what... Even though we can't earn grace, I think like Moses, we can position ourselves, place ourselves intentionally in a place where we can receive more of God's grace, more of God's blessings. For example, think of the contrary. I can't ask God to bless me with something while I'm, I am in a position of, of practicing sin. You know? I shouldn't expect God to bless me with, uh, uh, with, with something that I ask Him. If, 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 you know, if my hands are asking God to bless me about something and my feet are running to sin, obviously I'm not in a position to be blessed. It would be very hypocritical, wouldn't it? But if we are intentional about you know, seeking God's forgiveness, especially shortly after we have sinned as here, you know, God is there waiting to, to bless us as a loving Father. You know the story, I'm pretty sure at least half of you are familiar with the story of the prodigal son. Uh, Jesus tells the story in the presence of the religious leaders. And he talks about this uh, young man who couldn't wait to get his inheritance. He squandered the money, took off. He eventually lost it all. He's, a, he's now with the pigs. And, um, and then we read about him, you know, recognizing that he had a better at his father's house. The father here is a picture of, of God. And, and it's interesting because the, the loving father... Before the son even came, the loving father was already looking out in the distance, waiting for his son. And when his son comes, his son wasn't clean, by the way. He came dirty. He didn't give a two weeks notice. He just, he came, he was dirty, and his father embraces him. And that is just one picture of the many pictures the Bible gives us of God. He's, he's waiting to, uh, to embrace us, but he's not going to drag us back, right? We, we need to come to him. And, and look, we see this in... in uh, in the Gospel of John as well, in John three seventeen, which says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him, the world through Him might be saved. Okay? We see the heart of God here. So the question again is not, can I get a second chance? Because we know the answer, we can get a second chance if you're born again Christian. And even if you're, you know, if you're an unbeliever, there, there's, you know, you can have, if you're, if you receive Christ Jesus, he will, you know, forgive you of your sins and so on. The question is not, can I get a second chance, but will I take the second chance? God is never going to tell you, well, you know, you, you, um, you messed up one too many times, buddy, right? Uh, you're on your way to hell now. I don't believe that. I mean, uh, read the Gospel of John as well. He's giving you eternal life. So that's the first thing he needed to do, right? What did Moses need to do here in order to, uh, to go get the Ten Commandments again? He needed to wake up early. He needed to wake up early. 
he needed to get a set of, um, make a set of tablets so God can do his thing, so God can, can write the Ten Commandments there again. But there's something significant about waking up early. There's something significant about doing things in the morning that the Bible tries to sort of convey to, uh, um, to believers, to its first readers. I think it's something that they understood and something that we need to try to understand as well. For example, in Psalm 63.1, I want you to note what it says. It says, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. I think that's significant because it's early that God wants Moses to be ready, right? It's early that God wants Moses to start making his way up the mountain uh, to meet him. He doesn't tell him, hey, Moses, you know, if you find some time during your day, after your busy day dealing with two plus million Israelites, um, you know, I'm going to be up there and I'll meet you up there if you could make it. No, right? God is intentional about the timing. This is not a necessarily an invitation. This is an appointment that he needs to, uh, to make. And I think what this passage is trying to communicate to us here is that if God is going to be sought, if God is going to be found, he needs to be sought. You need to look for God, right? And I've touched on this a few weeks back, and, but I'll say it again. You know, God, uh, God is like treasure. God is precious. And we, we need to look for him. Obviously, he's, omni, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, but, but we need to be intentional about seeking God through his word, through prayer, and the more we seek him, the more, the more we find him. For example, if I just read my Bible like, uh, like I read the, you know, the updates on your iPhone, uh, nobody really reads those, you scroll all the way down, you click agree because you, you, know, you want the up, download or whatever. Um, if we read our Bible like that, we're not reading our Bible intentionally. We're just scrolling through, going through the motions. And, but if we read our Bible intentionally, then you know what? God is going to be intentional about, about revealing himself, to, about speaking uh, to us. And there's something about doing things first for God. In other words, I think what God is trying to tell Moses here is that I want your best. I don't want you to leave me till the end of your day when you're tired, when you're going to bed, when all you can say is, well, Lord, thank you for this day. Help us to wake up early tomorrow. God's like, why do you want me to wake you up early just so you can ignore me again the next day? You know, and, and I say that because I do that sometimes. You know, I just wait till the end of the day, pray with the kids, and here we go, going through the same things again. Our next point is this. God wants your first fruits, not your leftovers. That needs to be our priority. Giving God our, our first fruits, giving God our best. I forget what preacher said this, I think it's Spurgeon. Um, but he said, you know, if you, don't, if you don't seek God in the morning, chances are you're not going to find him throughout the day. You have to, you know, it's like, what's that saying, you know, the, the early bird gets the, the worm, right? The, the, the early Christian, you know, finds, finds the Lord, if that makes sense. Another interesting thing about Psalm 63.1 Psalm 63, um, is that the New King James renders it early, but most other translations render the word earnestly. If you have an NIV or any other translation, for the most part, they all, they all render it earnestly instead of early. So it reads, this way, you are my God. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. Is there a contradiction? No, there's no contradiction. But in the Hebrew, that word early and earnestly are, are almost synonymous. And that's the idea, I believe, that God wants to convey to us here, that to seek God early means to seek God seriously and, and, and earnestly with, the, with intentionality, with sincerity. Let me give you the definition according to the Oxford Dictionary. Earnestly means with sincere and intense conviction. Seriously. And I need to ask myself that. Am I, is that the way I seek God when I seek God or do I seek God half-heartedly? Half because remember, again, in verse 2, God is telling Moses, be ready in the morning, come up to the mountain in the morning. That tells me that God doesn't want my leftovers. He wants my first fruits. He wants my, uh, uh, you know, my, my energy, my first you know, thoughts for the day. I've noticed it because, you know, my job is I work from home. Obviously, I prepare messages and so on. And I've noticed that if I don't catch the day early enough... It's a lot harder to spend time with the Lord 
and then I find myself procrastinating. But if I wake up, the, the earlier I wake up, the more I, the more I can absorb of his word. And I think that's a practical application. I think some of you guys can agree with me on that when it comes to your time with the Lord. He wants your first fruits, not your, your leftovers. If you're with us on, uh, on Sunday, we went over Mark chapter 4. And there we talked about um, our hearing being a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? Uh, but there in that passage, Jesus says, he says, with the same measure you use, it shall be measured unto you in regards uh, to that. He was saying, in other words, well, the way you hear, if you're hearing bad, well, you're not going to get anything, really. If you're hearing well, well, you're going to get you're going to get more. And I think that also applies to the way we seek God. If we're not really seeking God with our whole heart, we're not going to really, you know, if I'm seeking God half-heartedly, then you know what? I might get a half answer from God if, from God if, if that. So the Bible tells us we ought to seek God with not our, you know, half heart, but with our whole hearts. That's what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Right? With the, with the whole heart. God wants a whole heart. That's what he's trying to communicate here with, uh, uh, to Moses. He wants your first fruits, not your left, not your leftovers. Now, I want, you to see, I want you guys to look at verse 4. Did you guys notice what Moses does here in verse 4? Moses, what he's doing here is, is cutting the tablets, the stone tablets, a day before he has to make the long trip up the mountain. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what's so special about that? I mean, he's, God told him to do that. And looking at it and seeing the timing that he does this is, is significant if you have a problem with procrastination when it comes to the things that, you know, that you do, whether it's for God or for your family or for your boss. So what I see Moses doing is just something practical. He's preparing in advance. He's not waiting till the morning to start cutting the tablets, right? I got to find the rock, you know, I got to cut it and I make my way up there. No, he does it. He does it before and he wakes up, he just grabs the tablets and he takes off. He goes up the mountain, right? I think that's important. And that's just one simple truth that we can apply uh, to our lives. Because see, you got, the thing, you got the tablets, right? And they're blank, and God could have very well just made some tablets appear. He, he didn't have, God could very easily just drop some tablets and, they, and that's it. You don't even have to do, make the trip, Moses. But just because God can do something doesn't mean God is going to do something. There's a reason about why Moses has to be involved and so on. And I believe what this is trying to tell us today is not just, you know, hey, some good advice, prepare in advance, but, but, but more so do, some, do the work that God wants you to do. The, do that foundational work so God can do the, the, add the finishing touches. Obey God, do what God has told you already, and, and wait for God to, you know, to complete the work, if you will. Our next point is this, we have to do the work of preparation for God to do the work of restoration. Don't expect to see renovation in your life. Don't expect to see these great, amazing changes if you refuse to change. If you refuse to, to, you know, put some work in it. If I want my marriage to get better, I can't just say, Lord, make it better. Yeah, you know, pray. Ask God to make your marriage better. But you got to put in the work, right? Because if you're not, a, chances are the reason your marriage is not where it needs to be is because you're not putting in the work of a, of a loving husband or of a submissive wife. You know, but it, it, marriage takes two people uh, for it uh, to work. So we pray and then we obey. Prayer is never a substitute for, uh, for obedience. And, and neither is here, right? You're going to get the Ten Commandments so the people can, can see them. Again, this is the Old Covenant. This is God's law. It was necessary for them. But, but again, the point is this. God's not going to bless it if you don't address it, right? If he, God can't change anything for you if you're not bringing it before Him. And that's why he needs to, you know, put in the work. God's not going to bless what we don't, what we don't bring him. So here's the question. How many times do we come to God empty-handed? Or we just, you know, we come to the Lord and we really don't have anything to, um, we're not really offering him anything. We, we're just praying to pray, you know, as a check mark on, on our list. I, I have to pray, so I'm going to pray. And, and obviously it shouldn't. It shouldn't be that way. 
Because I believe God is ready to, to sort of rewrite something in our lives. I think God is always um, uh, uh, wanting to do something new in our lives, something fresh. And He's always willing to do that, I believe. But are we willing to, to place ourselves sort of with a, a clean slate? For example, our heart. Coming to God with the right heart. A heart that is, we've been going over the parable of the four soils. If I come to God with a crowded heart, a heart that, you know, you know, is, is just uh, entangled with the things of the world, then God's not going to be able to do much with that heart. Because the seed can grow, but if, if, if there's, you know, corrosive things in my life, that's going to choke out the seed before it can produce any, any, any fruit, right? So I, I believe, just like Moses here is preparing the, the tablets, we also, too, before we come to God, we need to prepare our hearts, you know, cultivate a sensitive heart so we can get, you know, allow God to do what He needs to do in our lives. Look at verse 10 again. Towards the end there, it says, It is an awesome thing that I will do with you. It, it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. God could, uh, Moses could not get to that point where God told him, Hey, I'm going to do an awesome thing in your life. I don't know about you, but I want to be there where, where, in that position where, where I hear God tell me, Hey, I'm, I'm going to do a fresh start, Albert. Uh, I want to do an awesome thing in your family. In, in, in your church, in your life. Um, sometimes to get to that point of new beginnings, we need to, you know, get to the point of, of getting our hands dirty, of, 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 you know, coming to God without conditions, coming to God without reservations, coming to God with our, with our whole heart, just like Moses is coming with blank tablets, blank tablets that needed to be written on with the finger of God. Pastor Levi Lusco, maybe some of you guys are familiar with him. Uh, he pastors Fresh Life Church in uh, uh, Montana. He's got several churches over there. But he made an inter interesting observation uh, uh, in uh, John chapter 2 in the, the story of Jesus turning water into wine. There he said that uh, sometimes sermon preparation and the things we do for God sometimes is like, you know, water for us. He's like, well, wow, man, are they really going to, is this going to be enough for the people to, you know, is this really going to speak to anybody? And so, I mean, as a pastor, sometimes I feel like that. I was like, I'm studying this text. Is, how is this going to speak to people today? And, and, and he said that, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, our, our sermon prep and the things we, we, we do for God, it feels like water, just plain water before it gets to where it needs to get. And if you're familiar with that story of the water being turned into wine, you have the servants, and they're, getting, they're filling up the pitchers with the water, and, and they needed to take one pitcher to the master of the wedding banquet here. And they needed to do that in faith. But somewhere along the line, that water turned into wine. Something amazing happened to where the, you know, the, the master of the feast here, the banquet, you know, tasted new wines better than the, the first wine that was offered. And, and Levi was saying that sometimes the things we do for God, and he was using the example of a message and sermon prep, it can be like water, but somewhere along the line, it turns into something amazing, and it's in that delivery process. And sometimes I think, well, you know, is this message really going to speak to people? And I think I did, the, you know, the worst, you know, delivery. And then I hear, well, you know, that, that I needed to hear that today, Albert. And I'm like, really? You really needed to hear that? I've, I've been saying that. And, and really, I believe that's, that's that amazing work that God does sometimes because it's, it's the Holy Spirit working through, these, through the ink and, and the pages and us making noise with our mouths. God, God works through that. He makes it amazing. It's not just us making noise. It's God doing something uh, amazing. And that's what God is telling him here in verse 10. It's an, it is an awesome thing that I will do. Notice, with you. He's going to do an amazing thing with you. You are included in the thing that God wants to do in your life. But we got to get involved, right? We have to do the work of preparation for God to do the work of restoration. Much of what we do for God, not everything, but much of what we do for God uh, is a response to His Word, how, how His Word spoke to us. God, often what he's doing is responding to what we have done initially. If I, if I read a passage in the Bible that says, Hey, Albert, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm fornicating. I'm not married. I'm sleeping around. And it says, and, and, and I finally read it, it says, you know, uh, the fornicator will be judged or the adulterous or non-incarnate. You know, one of those verses. And, and I, I choose to obey that word. 
and it, then, then I'm going to see God respond in my life. And often that's what happens with people. They start obeying God's word. They start reading it and obeying it. And then they start seeing amazing things. Why? Because God responded to their obedience. And, and it's interesting because here, um, it's not till Moses gets to the top of the mountain that God comes down and as a sort of response, okay, you're finally here. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to come down and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey, or excuse me, I'm going to you know, display myself before you. Here's what I'm saying. Moses had to come up for God to come down. Okay? Moses came up and God came down. God responded to his obedience. You and I, we, we, need, to, uh, we need to step up so God can step down. We need to step up in our lives so God can step down and do his thing. That's our, our, our next point. Step up so God can step down. Step up what? Well, step up. Uh, whatever the Lord is calling you to do. If there's something that you know God has called you to do and you're not doing it, then obviously you're not stepping up, right? You're not climbing any mountains for the Lord. And what does it mean to step down? Well, stepping down is God, or stepping in is God, is God getting involved in your life. So step up so God can step in your life and do that, that work that you've been waiting for Him to do. I mean, maybe you've been praying for God to deliver you of something that, you know, you always keep running back, back to, but you haven't been obeying that verse that says in Galatians, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now I can say, Lord, deliver me of the sin, but if I continue to keep walking in the flesh, uh, I can't blame God if I'm not, I'm not free of that, right? I can't blame God if, if I know if I walk through a certain aisle or to go to a certain store that I always end up overspending. If I keep going to that store, right? I can't blame God for my, my uh, if, if I'm trying to lose weight or my obesity, uh, especially if I have diabetes, and I keep driving by the donut store. Every time I drive by the donut store, I end up buying donuts. So you, you got to do your part, right? You got to obey the Lord. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, you know these things. Blessed are you if you do these things, right? It's pointless to just know stuff if you're not going to do the stuff. There is no real blessing in just knowing stuff. Not really. The, the point is, is to do what God has told you. That's where the blessing is found. That's what Jesus is saying. Um, anyway, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do this, these things. So the problem with us as Christians, I think it's not a, a limited amount of information. Sometimes I think it's that uh, we know too much. We know enough to do, you know, enough for the Lord. Sometimes it's a limited, limited amount of motivation where we're not, we're not surrounding ourselves with people that... Uh, maybe are stronger, where we are weaker. We're not surrounding ourselves with people that are going to, you know, encourage us. People that are going to stir us in, in, uh, to good works, as Hebrews chapter 10 says. So, we, you know, we have to step up. We have to step up for God to step in. Moses came up, went up, so God can come uh, down. I'll finish with this. Moses stepped up the mountain, and God came down and gave him the Ten Commandments. Elijah, the prophet Elijah, stepped up another mountain. He went up uh, Mount Carmel. And there he saw God's glory. He saw God's, you know, victory over the, the prophets of Baal. There was a blessing because there was an obedience attached to it, right? Mary, the mother of Jesus, she stepped up and, and carried Jesus to full term. And there we have the, you know, the blessing of that, the Savior of the world came, right? Jesus stepped up to the, the cross, and, and now we have salvation for those that would believe in him. What has God called you to step up and do so he can step in and do that work, that finishing work in your life, so you can step out and continue to carry that out? What is that? I'll end with that. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we know you, uh, you have a, a, plan, a perfect plan for each and every one of us. You want us to, to continue to walk in that plan. You want us to, to step in and start walking in that plan if we are not. I just pray, Lord, that you make that plan clear to us. That if we're not seeking you, seeking your direction from you, Lord, that we would, you would put us in a place where we can listen better. Help us to hear, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.